One of the things that is a really interesting problem is just why Zen has become so fascinating to many people in the West. Because as you find Zen in Japan today, it's a pretty tough scene. There are very few Japanese interested in it. The monastery of Myoshinji in Kyoto was built to accommodate 600 monks. There are now 30. For example, I wanted to have a conversation with a learned priest of the Shingon sect and uh, I had two interpreters. His wife, who speaks very good English, and the interpreter we had for our group. And as we got into things, they started to say, sorry, but this is impossible to translate into English. We, we don't know what it means. So I said, all right, let's get some paper. And when any word arose that they didn't understand, I had him write it in Chinese characters, which I can more or less read. And so we managed to con converse in this very strange roundabout way of the syntax being conveyed by the interpreters and the actual terms uh, being written. <laughs> but that shows you, you see, that the quite intelligent people, but the interpreter was a very intelligent man and the priest's wife a very well-educated woman. But they don't know what it's all about. So how come then, you see, this fascination in the West? Well, uh, it's due very largely to the way in which certain people have presented Zen to the West, notably Suzuki and R. H. Blythe. They have made a great use of the Zen story or the anecdotes there is a book of Zen anecdotes, these conversations between the masters and their students. They're called Mondo, or Question Answer. There is a book which uh, is called the Mumon Khan, and it's a, just a collection of, of stories. And I remember a friend of mine in England, when this was first in circulation, getting this book when he was in hospital. And he said, I don't understand it at all, but it's cheered me up immensely. So the typical sort of Zen story uh, where a student asks the teacher a question, what is the fundamental meaning of Buddhism? And the master says, wait around until there's no one here and I'll tell you. So later the student says to him, now there's nobody around, Master, what is it? And he takes him out into the garden and he points at the bamboos. And the student says, I don't understand. The master says, what a long bamboo that one is. What a short one that one is. Period. It has a kind of a shaggy dog feeling. It has a, uh, it just leaves you wondering well, what's this meant to convey? And the answer, of course, is that Suzuki explains most carefully, it's not a symbolical tale. In other words, you're not supposed to understand that bamboos symbolize something uh, in, in the way that, for example, the parables in the New Testament are symbolical tales. It's not like that at all. All these Zen Mondo are absolutely clear. There is no concealed symbolism except in very rare incidents. And then the symbolic element is subordinate. Always the answer is completely straight. For example, there is a famous koan where the answer to the question, what is the fundamental meaning of Buddhism, is the second son of the Shou family and the third son of the Ko family. 
something like that. And uh, once a student uh, gave an answer to this koan, and the teacher accepted it, but the teacher's chief student, who was standing by at the time, said when the other student had gone away, he said, I think you should test him on this. And uh, I don't think he really understands. So he called him back the next day and said, uh, gave him this koan again, and he gave the same answer as he gave before. And the teacher said, no, no, that won't do at all. But she said, Master, you accepted this answer yesterday. But the master replied, yesterday it was yes, but today it is no. When another, when we had a, a, a talk with uh, one of the great Roshis in Japan on our last visit, we were discussing the translation of Zen texts into English. And there's quite a work going on in that way. But he said it's not necessary. If you understand Zen, you can use any book to teach it with. You could use the Bible, you could use Alice in Wonderland. After all, he said, the sound of the rain needs no translation. And this is a very, very straight story, you see. This is saying exactly what it's about in the plainest language. Only people overlook it. You know, when something's right under your nose and you can't see it, and you go looking over there, 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 and you're carrying it, you see. It's like that. And so uh, Suzuki has explained that that's the way it is. That uh, once when Saburo Hasegawa, who was a great Japanese painter, was at a dinner party here in San Francisco, somebody asked him, uh, what about understanding Zen? How long does it take? He said, it might take you 30 years. It might take you three minutes. I mean that. So you see the element of fascination? that it's right under your nose. You're looking right at it, you see. It's like uh, you, you do get sort of strangely puzzled when you've lost something and somebody's kidding you. They're not pointing it out to you, but to say, why don't you see it? It's right there. And you can't for the life of you. It, I mean, it's far more interesting, that sort of situation, than something that's really difficult to find. In a way, you'd have to go digging under the floors. I mean, if someone, if a, if a treasure were concealed in the walls of this ferry boat, you know, we'd have to go digging through the walls and looking with all sorts of things. But here is the treasure concealed in full view and concealed by being in full view, but in the place that's too obvious to look. So that's the flavor of Zen. And that's why it's become so fascinating. Also, there are other elements in it that uh, it has a humor to it, which is peculiarly Chinese. I don't think the Japanese have quite the humor in their Zen that the Chinese had. And you, because, you see, this humor comes from Taoism. The, the, say, the writings of Zhuangzi, who uh, was the great Taoist philosopher who lived shortly after 300 BC. He's the only really great humorous philosopher. And that flavor has passed on into Zen. And also, Zen is uh, something experiential. It, you're not required to believe in anything. It doesn't have any doctrines. It entirely consists in a state of consciousness. Awakened consciousness. So as if I were to say to you, you, if you were puzzled about some, you know, you were what Tillich calls concerned about being. What is this thing, life? Why are we here? Why, why is it suffering? 
Why do all these creatures multiply in different ways and shapes? Why are the ducks? Why are the trees? Why are the snails, clams, people, all that? For heaven's sakes, why? And why do they come and go? And what happens to them when they go? We all want to know that. So that's the kind of concern. Now Zen answers this, not with an idea, but with a changed state of consciousness. And we, you never know whether you can get that changed state of consciousness instantly, right now, without further ado, or whether you have to work for it many long years. There was an American student of Zen who went to Japan on a Fulbright. And uh, he studied and studied. He practiced his meditations and uh, sat in the meditation posture with all the other monks. And the, of course, part of the technique is to work up a state of intense doubt, puzzling about what is it? You know, what's this? You know, what is it? What is existence? What is isness? Well, he worked and worked and worked at it. And uh, nothing happened. And the time for his stay was be very close to the end. And he couldn't get a renewal of the ground. And he had to go back to the United States. And he thought, this is uh, absolutely terrible. I won't get it. I won't get the satori, the awakened insight. So he went to the master and said, look, this is desperate. You've got to help me. The master said, now, look, you, what you've got to do is now go into what's called session. Uh, session means uh, study of the mind, but it means prolonged meditation where you hardly even sleep. And he says, you really get to work on it. and You come and see me four times a day and see if you can answer your koan, and I'll help you. So he worked and he worked and he worked and he sat there and nothing happened. Nothing happened. <laughs> until almost the day he had to leave, when suddenly he saw that there was nothing to realize. And then he had it. You see, Zen works on this principle, and it's called using an empty fist to deceive a child. You know when you say now to a child, what have I got here? And the child is all interest, what is in there? and you hide your hand this way, that way, and so on. The child is fantastically interested. And then finally, there's nothing. So in the same way, you can get a problem about life, which is a closed fist. What is it all about? It's like asking, what's the pit in the middle of an onion? and you take off all the skins and so on, so on, so on, and suddenly you find you've got a litter of skins and no pit. There wasn't anything in it. And you might say, well, that's, it's a hoax. It's a, the life is a deception, a tale told by an idiot. And yet, what you had missed in looking for the pit were the beautiful skins. See, that's the edible part of the onion. Whereas you may peel a potato, the onion is all skin, but excellent. Now, the, what, what one has done under these circumstances is you have missed the point by being too eager. You have therefore overlooked what was obvious. And so problems are made about the nature of the universe by asking the wrong questions. May I repeat that there are four great philosophical questions. And in a way they are all of them mistaken. But they are the questions that people have asked through all history about the world. One, who started it? Two, are we going to make it? Three, where are we going to put it? And four, who's going to clean up? Plato, Aristotle, Kant, 
uh, Descartes are all discussing these four questions. Now, you see, but the, if you begin at the beginning, who started it? That's a, a, a misleading question. <laughs> Nobody did. <laughs> it was always here. You know, it is what there is. And uh, you've had it, man. <laughs> but if you, if you get on to that, you know, uh, what, what do you see? When there's some kind of shenanigans going on, the police come by. They want to know who started it. They're looking for a ringleader because they want someone to blame. Society requires that somebody should be blamed. So what we do is, we, the, from childhood, all human beings get together and they make up the idea that you started it. Only it's no fun if we know immediately who started it. Uh, it has to be sort of concealed. So people tell lies and uh, cover up and so on. And uh, so we want to know who's good guys and who are the bad guys. Really, there aren't any differences. We are all collectively doing what we are doing. And because one person is, as we know, say, a criminal, uh, it has to do with his parents and his environment and so on. But that mustn't be admitted because we wouldn't know how to deal with all of us. You see, if, if the thing that's, that, that's the matter with human beings is all human beings, in addition to their environment and the fishes and the birds and everything, it all goes together. It's absolutely interconnected. And, uh, but, so, but that's no fun, you see. So we, break, we pretend that it's all broken up into bits and that one starts it and so on. So once you've done that, once you've broken it all up into bits, and they start playing cops and robbers, then you have problems. And uh, it may be fun to have problems. It's perfectly all right to have problems. Because that's the, the, the interest of things. We make life interesting by making it difficult. And sometimes we overdo it. And then it gets desperate, and then people begin to ask, well, what's it all about? Why are we doing this? Then you have to go to a Zen master or somebody like that to be cured of your illusions. And the way he does it, you see, is to make you ask intensely, what is it? What is the sound of one hand? Listen, you know, really listen. What is the sound of one hand? What is that? See, when somebody asks a Zen master, what is the fundamental meaning of Buddhism? He said, the cypress tree in the yard. All right, go out there and look at it. Or just the sound, moo. The great master Joshu was asked, does a dog have Buddha nature? And he said, no. Moo in Chinese. Well, everybody knows if they studied any Mahayana Buddhism, that not only do dogs have in them Buddha nature, which means uh, the capacity to become a Buddha, an awakened one, or you could say it means Buddha nature could roughly mean the divine center. So why did the master say no? So they, what they do is this. They, they work on the word no. And sometimes the masters teach them to say no, really. Now he says, say no, shout it. And the student shouts. And the teacher says, uh-uh, you didn't really mean it, try again. And so he, he gets to yelling, no. You see, no, 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 you see. And the teacher says, no, this is not good enough. Get behind it, get with it. And the student gets so frustrated, he suddenly realizes he can't say no. Well, now, you know a little bit about this. Supposing you take the word no, and you say it many times. No, 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 no. And it becomes funny. You wonder, isn't it strange that this funny sound no, which makes you itch a little bit on the tip of your nose, uh, means no. Well, what does no mean? <laughs> what does it mean 
that you know what I mean when I say no. See, I mean, no means I won't. <laughs> I don't want any dinner or something. Uh, I won't play with you. But take the situation of uh, a person making this exchange with another. See, we, we know the meaning of the word no, but what does it mean that we are able to have this exchange of meaning, this communication? Does that mean anything? Well, it, in a way it doesn't. You can come and sit over here, there's plenty of room. Yeah. Uh, what... What that is, you see, the fact that we as human beings communicate, that we say, how do you do in the morning and goodbye at night, that we eat, that we have children, and uh, they all put in little boxes, and they, uh, you know, become doctors and lawyers and business executives, and they do this and they do that. It's just like the trees grow up and they do this, and they wave in the wind, and the birds flap around, and they eat things, and that makes bird, because all the food you eat flows into your shape, just like a flowing stream has a whirlpool in it, and uh, it keeps the whirlpool there, but the whirlpool is never the same water. It goes on and on. So in just the same way, all these creatures are a kind of a tide of food, and it goes in, and it does that creature, and it flaps around, and then it goes out again. So w what's all that about? Uh, in the Buddhist philosophy, that all that is called thusness. Uh, it's like that. Like, uh, did you ever see a lady go this way, go that way? And so a Buddha is called in Sanskrit a tathagata, which means one who comes or goes thus. It's very simple. That's, the, that's what it's doing. And things are doing that only to make a, a kind of game of it. We put valuations on it. It's like poker. You get chips. How much are the chips worth? Well, they're worth anything you want to say they're worth. So in the same way, all this is going on, and you say, well, what is important? Is there something important here? Well, yes, we say, there are certain things that are more important than others. We, we've agreed among ourselves, because we are people, that we are more important than seagulls. And the seagulls have agreed among themselves that they're more important than people. And uh, they, they recognize their kind, and they pick out in life all the things that are significant to their needs as we pick out the things that are significant to our needs. And we say, now, that's the thing that really must happen. But actually, nothing must happen. It just, it just happens. And that's called thusness or suchness. And so the Zen is concerned, the, 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 the uh, whole nature of Zen is to get you back to seeing the suchness of things. You, it's a process of unhypnotizing you. You see, when you, you hypnotize people by making them pay attention, so I want you to look very closely at my finger. I want you to relax completely and uh, pay attention only to this finger here. See? And uh, there are many other ways of doing it. You, you, you hypnotize people much better by not letting them know that's what you're doing. And all showbiz and teaching and so on is hypnosis. So your parents began to hypnotize you the moment you were born because they told you what was important to look at. You know, a baby looks at everything. A baby is interested in just anything uh, around. I mean, children sometimes point out things for which we have no words. They say, what's that? And you say, what do you mean? <laughs> well, don't you see? That? Uh, well, look, it's perfectly clear. I, that? What's, what's, the, what's, what's the word for that? You suddenly realize that they are pointing out a configuration of patterns on something that we don't have a word for. I mean, we, for example, we don't have a, a, a single word in English for dry space. We don't have a word for uh, 
most kinds of smell. For example, the smell...